Perfect. Um, yeah, so again, just before I begin, a huge thank you to the Canadian Council on Invasive Species for allowing the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council to join in on their webinar week. It's been a really fun week full of really great talks, and I'm really happy to be a part of it. So like Jessica mentioned, I'm Kristen Knoll and I'm the Council Supervisor for the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council. And today I'm going to be giving a talk on the impacts of aquatic invasive species on species at risk with a Nova Scotia focus, but a lot of this is you, can be translated across the country. So we're, today we'll be talking about what are invasive species, how they get here, how they spread once they are here, how they impact species at risk. I'll give a couple examples of some particularly prevalent invasive species in Nova Scotia, and then we can wrap it up with what we can do to help prevent the spread and stop the introduction. So first of all, the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council is a provincial chapter of the Canadian Council on Invasive Species. It was formerly known as the Invasive Species Alliance of Nova Scotia, and it operated out of Acadia University um, in 2012. And our goal is to raise awareness and promote a coordinated response to the threat of invasive species in Nova Scotia. So I guess a good question to start off with is, what, what is an invasive species? We consider an invasive species to be any organism that meets the following criteria. It's non-native, it spreads rapidly, and it causes some kind of harm. So that could be a lot of the times we think of ecological harm and environmental harm, but this can also be socioeconomic harm and recreational harm as well. So it just needs to meet those three criteria, and we can consider it a, an invasive species. And a lot of the times we think of invasive species as just plants and animals, but it can actually be pathogens as well, including bacteria, fungi, and nematodes. And these are just some examples of different organisms that can be an invasive species. So how do invasive species get here? They get here a lot of ways, and most of them are due to humans bringing them in. So they can get here by us planting them in our gardens, releasing unwanted pets into the wild, like we see that goldfish up there in the picture, uh, dumping aquarium plants, introducing new species for hunting or angling purposes, they can come in on commercial wood imports and also on international and interprovincial shipping. And once they're here, they can spread naturally by floating downstream, by animal, animal dispersal, or by natural movement. So say a fish swimming downstream. Uh, but again, they can spread a, a, a lot of the ways that they get here is also how they spread and it's uh, thanks to, to humans again. So they can hitch rides on boat trailers, in ballast water tanks, uh, seeds can get stuck in your hiking boot treads or maybe on your dog or your animal, and they can be moved by firewood and by not cleaning off your recreational equipment. So I'll show some more specific examples shortly. But impacts of invasive species include, but are certainly not limited to, reduced native biodiversity, increased competition for resources, increased predation, and they can be harmful to human health, infrastructure, and recreation. It's widely accepted that invasive species are a huge threat to biodiversity worldwide. In Canada alone, more than 20% of our species at risk are threatened with extinction by invasive species. And invasive species can do this by predating na native species, taking their food and space, contributing to soil degradation and erosion, integrating water quality, and just generally altering habitat. They can also introduce new diseases, and some even have adverse effects on human health. Think giant hogweed that leaves those nasty burns on your skin if you touch it. Invasive species alter infrastructure, and from an economic viewpoint, invasive species can greatly impact productivity in forestry, agricultural, and fishing industries, as well as reduce recreational opportunities. So we recently launched a survey in Nova Scotia to kind of try to measure Nova Scotians' awareness of species at risk and invasive species. And we wanted to know how Nova Scotians were connecting with nature and interacting with nature. So to start off, we wanted to know, are people familiar with the term invasive species? Do they know what an invasive species is? 
And we were kind of shocked. 97% of the participants of the survey are familiar with invasive species and they know what invasive species are. So that's really great that right off the bat, we know that that's not a gap we have to bridge. We don't need to really get the message out as much about what an invasive species is. A lot of people are generally really aware. And then we wanted to know if people are familiar with the term species at risk. And before I share the results of that uh, question, maybe I'm asking Jessica or Gabby can put a poll out to all the participants to ask if you're familiar with the term species at risk. So very familiar, somewhat familiar or not familiar. And I'll just give it a couple seconds here for everyone to get their votes in. Okay, and yeah, so 70% are very familiar, 17% are somewhat familiar, and there's 13% that aren't very familiar at all. And that's really close to what we found in Nova Scotia as well. Um, oops. Yep, so we asked, are you familiar with the term species at risk? And 94% said yes, and 3% said unsure, and 3% said uh, no. So that's really similar to what we just found across Canada. So that is nice that it was representative. Um, but generally people know what species at risk are and what invasive species are, um, which is really great that that education is already there. So after this, we asked, are people aware of any invasive species in the area in which you live and work? And 77% said yes, 11% said they weren't sure, and 12% said no. So then we asked the same question, but with species at risk. So keep in mind that 77% of people knew of invasive species in the places where they live and work. And keep in mind that this isn't just, we asked people to list examples and we were expecting a lot of it to just be uh, Japanese knotweed and just some common garden plants. But we actually had a lot of diversity in the answers to examples of invasive species. So then we asked if you're aware of species at risk. And it's funny because only 50% said yes. So we had a 25% decline in how aware people are of invasive species around them versus species at risk. So that identifies that we can do a little bit more education on what kind of species at risk are around us. So I guess this is a really good spot, a good place to start. So I'll start with a definition of what is a species at risk. So a species at risk is any plant or animal that's in danger of disappearing from the wild. And once we have a Species at Risk Act here in Canada, and once a species is listed under the Species at Risk Act, it becomes illegal to kill, harass, capture, or harm it in any way. And this also protects, the Species at Risk Act also protects habitats um, of these species at risk from destruction. The Act also requires that recovery strategies, action plans, and management plans be listed for all species. And this helps kind of plan conservation planning and how we want to approach helping out these species that need our help to maybe recover their populations a little bit. So today I'm going to be talking about a couple of species at risk um, that are on the aquatic side that we find here in Nova Scotia. So first up, we have the Atlantic whitefish, and then the Atlantic salmon, the brook floater, yellow lamp mussel, and turtles. This is a Blanding's turtle shown here. And while turtles aren't fully aquatic, uh, I, they're a really charismatic species and I wanted to include them in this, in this presentation. So we'll go into each example a little bit in depth and keep in mind that these are by no means the only aquatic invasive species or species at risk in Nova Scotia. I just chose a handful to highlight here today. So first up, we have the Atlantic whitefish. Yep, and the Atlantic whitefish is in the same family as salmon and trout, it's a salmonid. And the Petite Riviere population contains the last remaining wild population of Atlantic wild whitefish in the entire world. They're a lake resident, which means that they complete their life cycle in fresh water. And the Atlantic whitefish's habitat is limited to just three small interconnected freshwater lakes within the upper Petite Riviere watershed here in Nova Scotia. So some of the, the threats that the Atlantic whitefish face are smallmouth bass and chain pickerel. So I'll go a little bit into each fish before talking about the impacts that they might have on Atlantic whitefish. 
So smallmouth bass, like we see here, are a freshwater fish with a brown to greenish body and a white belly. They have a, their habitat includes lakes and streams with rocky bottoms and plenty of shade. And it is an, an, an oh, sorry, an efficient predator of many fish, uh, mammals, and amphibians. It pretty much eats anything that's smaller than it or that it can fit in its mouth. Not only does it eat native species, but it also consumes much of the food which some native fish require for survival. Smallmouth bass is spread by intentional introduction for angling purposes. It made its way to Nova Scotia through an authorized release in 1942 in Bunkers Lake, Yarmouth County, as sanctioned by the government for sport fishing. And the last authorized introduction occurred in 1984, so not too long ago. And spread of both the smallmouth bass and chain pickerel, which I'm about to talk about, uh, threatens native fish communities in more than half of the primary watersheds here in Nova Scotia. So the chain pickerel is, a, is a, also a freshwater fish. Uh, it's kind of torpedo shaped and it has a green body with a darker back and a white belly. Adults have a chain like pattern, like you can see there along their sides, and this is actually part of their namesake. And chain pickerel inhabit shallow vegetated ponds, lakes, and sluggish streams. They are also voracious predators known to consume, again, just about anything they can fit in their mouths. Not only do they alter aquatic ecosystems, which causes havoc for native biodiversity, but they also negatively impact sport fishing opportunities. The chain pickerel is an introduced fish species to Nova Scotia, initially planted in three lakes in 1945, and its distribution has spread to 95 known locations over time. All of these introductions have stemmed from the initial first three. So that means these 95 lakes, that's all came from people spreading chain pickerel from those first three lakes, which is crazy to me. Um, so smallmouth bass were confirmed in all three lakes in the Petit Riviere in 2000, and chain pickerel were confirmed in 2010. So despite stewardship, outreach, and public education, smallmouth bass and chain pickerel continue to spread through illegal transfers between watersheds. Both are found in the same watershed as the Atlantic whitefish. As I mentioned, the bass were confirmed in 2000 and chain pickerel shortly after in 2010. And they are known to prey on Atlantic whitefish. So they'll eat Atlantic whitefish and they also increase competition for Atlantic whitefish for important resources like food and space and uh, spawning habitat. But uh, they're pretty, both of those fish are pretty good at what they do. They're very good at being invasive. So that's how they be, kind of begin to outnumber the Atlantic whitefish pretty quickly. Next up, we have Atlantic salmon. And just like the Atlantic whitefish, Atlantic salmon are also in the same family, salmonids. They're anadromous, which means they live in both fresh and salt water, and they have a complex life history that begins with spawning, and then the juveniles um, get reared in rivers, and then they migrate to salt water to feed, grow, and mature before returning to fresh water to spawn. They're considered an indicator species or a bioindicator, and this means that the health of the species is directly impacted by its ecosystem. So when a river ecosystem is clean and well-connected, its salmon population is typically healthy and robust. However, when a river ecosystem is not clean or well-connected, or perhaps it has invasive species and its native biodiversity is declining, its salmon population is usually not doing too hot. So we have quite a few populations in Nova Scotia with the inner Bay of Fundy population listed as endangered. And which, what is probably not going to come as a surprise to many of you, chain pickerel and smallmouth bass, again, are one of the reasons for the decline with through increased predation and competition for resources. We kind of have a theme here going with the invasive fish. Another invasive species that can impact Atlantic salmon is yellow iris or yellow flag iris. And it is a perennial aquatic plant that was first introduced to um, North America somewhere around the 1800s. It's native to Europe, Western Asia, and North Africa, and it grows in a variety of wetland habitats from open shorelines to lakes to rivers. You can find it on the ditches alongside the road sometimes. 
um, and also in marshes and wetlands. So yellow iris can be identified by its three bright, uh, bright yellow sepals. I don't know if you can see them there. And uh, the roots of yellow iris can form dense mats which trap sediment and reduce habitat. The introduction of yellow iris into critical habitat will have negative impacts on already declining populations. So yellow iris, as I mentioned, forms dense stands and thus causes sediment to be trapped, which reduces habitat. And as more and more yellow iris stands are established, more and more sediments are trapped and the stream becomes smaller and it loses width. So the more that yellow iris builds up along the sides, we see the river, the available habitat starts to become smaller. And loss of habitat means that less fish are able to spawn and fewer eggs will be able to survive. Moving on to our next species at risk, we have two freshwater mussel species. On the left here, we have brook floater, and on the right, we have yellow lamp mussel. And both of these are listed as special concern in Nova Scotia. The brook floater, so on the left, is distributed in Eastern North America, and the species has disappeared from about half of the known locations in the States. In Canada, the brook floater occurs in a small number of rivers, and in Nova Scotia, we can find it in the Annapolis, the La Have, Gaze, Wallace, East St. Mary's, and Salmon Rivers. And for the yellow lamp mussel, it's only known to exist in two locations in Canada, the Sydney River in Cape Breton, and the Lower St. John River near Fredericton, New Brunswick. Blackett's Lake, which formed when the Sydney River was dammed, so it's also in Cape Breton, um, uh, is the main center of the yellow lamp mussel population in Nova Scotia. And these mussels can be uh, threatened by a lot of different invasive species that are just generally altering habitat. But some of the scarier invasive species that we're trying to watch out for are zebra mussels and quagga mussels. And now we don't have zebra and quagga mussels in the Maritimes right now. We definitely want to make sure that we keep it that way. So on the left, we have a picture of zebra mussels. And then we have a boat propeller that has just been covered in zebra mussels. And then on the right, we have quagga mussels. And you can see that's just a pipe there. And the first pipe is after, like it's brand new. And then you can see the progression of the colonization of the mussels. So that last tube where it's just covered in mussels, that's only six months that that pipe was in the lake with quagga mussels. So they, they are pretty destructive. They multiply rapidly and they can survive out of water for a long period of time, which makes it, that's kind of scary when you're thinking about how they can spread. If they can stay out of water, it could be on your boat and then two weeks later you bring it into a new body of water and they can bounce back from that. So once they're allowed to spread, they outcompete native species, such as the brook floater and yellow lamp mussel. Um, for important resources like space and food, and they also remove plankton from the water, which is an important food source for a lot of bivalves. But removing plankton also increases the amount of sunlight in the water, which can cause warmer temperatures and lead to toxic algal blooms. Large colonies of the mussels can also affect important fish spawning sites. And as you can see here, they can also really impact uh, infrastructure. So they're really nefarious to the aquaculture industry because once they're introduced, they just, they just take over. Now we have our turtles at risk. Um, so on the very left, we have the landings turtle, which is endangered. Then we have the eastern painted turtle, which is of special concern. The snapping turtle, which is the third turtle there, and it kind of looks like a dinosaur. That's also of special concern. And then we have the wood turtle on the very far right there, and that is threatened in Nova Scotia. And these turtles, while they are very different, they all rely on critical habitat to survive. And they use what we call riparian habitat in different wetlands. So because of this, th these are kind of fragile ecosystems that can be easily kind of taken over by invasive species. So some of the threats that all, all of these turtle species kind of face are Again, smallmouth bass and chain pickerel for competition for resources like food and space. But chain pickerel and smallmouth bass have also been known to eat turtle hatchlings before and eggs. So they are, even though they're not a typical predator of a turtle, um, they can still do quite, quite the damage. We also have red-eared sliders. 
And invasive redwood sliders cause negative impacts in the ecosystems that they occupy because they have certain advantages over native turtle populations, such as a lower age of maturity. So that means they can reproduce earlier in life than our native species. Higher fecundity rates, which means that they reproduce more offspring than our native turtles do. And they have a larger body size. And that just generally gives them a better advantage uh, when it comes to finding basking sites and nesting sites, and as well as exploiting food resources. Uh, they can also transmit diseases that our native turtles don't have the defenses to combat. And um, they also take up, comp compete for breeding space. So they're a popular pet species. And a lot of the times, unfortunately, people release the species when they can no longer care for it into urban, setting, urban settings like ponds and parks. Um, and we actually have quite a few sightings in Nova Scotia with some agglomerations around Frog Pond and Halifax Public Gardens, which are both in the Halifax Regional Municipality. Another threat of turtles is Phragmites. And Phragmites is a very tall grass, as you can see there with, that's Ellen Bellivo standing next to the Phrag there. Uh, it's a very tall grass that can grow up to four meters. It looks really similar to our native subspecies. So we have native Phragmites as well. Um, but there are some key differences. It's some, a lot of the times it's taller, it has a bigger flowering head. Um, and you can also tell sometimes just by the way it acts. So it forms these really dense stands that exclude native species uh, and their roots, which can actually spread several meters per year, which is a mind blowing if you think about it. Uh, so they can quickly form these huge dense stands in wetlands that exclude native species, alter the structure and function of native marsh ecosystems and wetlands, and which is critical riparian habitat for turtles. And it can also, because it does this to wetlands, it can dry out turtle nesting habitat, which, which is really heartbreaking to see. Um, it was likely introduced to North America in ship's ballast tanks, uh, and it spread as an ornamental for a little bit. And it is present in Nova Scotia, with the earliest specimen collection in Nova Scotia going back to 1910. So it's in about maybe a third to a half of the counties in Nova Scotia now. And when you see it, it is quite striking because it's just this, this really tall, massive grass and you don't really see things like that too often. So I guess just a general statement about the impacts of invasive species is that they collectively threaten species at risk. It doesn't matter if they're aquatic or terrestrial, or what species at risk we're talking about. Typically invasive species increase the threat of predation, they alter habitat, they reduce biodiversity, and they increase competition for really important resources. So now that we know about invasive species and some species at risk, how do we get rid of invasive species? Well, we could eradicate them, but that takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, and it uses up a lot of resources. So this is a really great graphic that we call an invasion curve. And it's just when you, you see if we go from left to right here, when an invasive species is introduced, prevention or eradication is pretty, it's, it's okay. We could probably manage it, it's easy. But the, the, the kind of catch here is that between introduction and detection could be a long time. Like it could be present for a while before we're aware of it. So after detection, eradication is still feasible, but as time goes on and as we move up the curve, public awareness typically doesn't begin until eradication is already very unlikely. And at the top of the curve, we have local control and management are likely the only options. So prevention is key and management gets more difficult and more expensive the further we go along the curve. So aside from eradication, what else can we do? we can prevent the introduction and we can reduce the spread. And how do we do this? One of the best ways is early detection and rapid response. And we can do this with something we call citizen science. And citizen science is a term used to describe members of the general public who contribute to scientific research. Many different people make up the citizen science community. Children, students, bird watchers, amateur astronomers, gardeners and naturalists, all of whom share an interest in science or nature. 
Citizen science takes many forms, such as simply reporting species observations, making new discoveries, or volunteering with scientists to collect data. Citizen scientists play a key role in identifying invasive species throughout Nova Scotia, and they're valuable to organizations such as the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council due to their ability to collect and interpret data and broaden research. For example, when citizen scientists report their invasive species observations in our iNaturalist project, it allows the NSISC staff to see exactly where invasive species populations are established, if any new species have in, been introduced, if they've spread to new regions, and yeah, it's really important when you're talking about managing invasive species. So you can become a uh, citizen scientist for the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council by joining our iNaturalist project, which is titled Invasive Species in Nova Scotia. And then you can start reporting your invasive species op observations. Uh, if somebody could link that in the chat, that would be great. We'd love to welcome some new members to that project. So that's just a, an overview of the page where we have our project on iNaturalist. So some of the issues with citizen science and iNaturalist is just getting people to be more aware of it. So during the same survey that I talked about earlier that we gave out to Nova Scotians to measure their understanding of invasive species and species at risk, we asked them, how familiar are you with citizen science? And only 30% answered they're very familiar or extremely familiar. And then we similarly asked them, how familiar are you with iNaturalist? And we got similar results with 30% uh, being very familiar or extremely familiar. But this is good news in a way because it identifies to us that we need to do a better job in promoting citizen science, promoting iNaturalist and getting the word out and letting people know that there are these resources and if you spend time outside, you could be helping scientists learn more about invasive species and hopefully stop, uh, prevent new introductions. Aside from citizen science, there's a lot of other things we can do too. We have these behavior change programs um, through the Can Canadian Council on Invasive Species. And we have more than just these three, but I picked out the three that are more prevalent to aquatics because that's what this presentation is kind of focused on so far today. So we have Clean Drain Dry, which is a program uh, kind of targeting watercraft users, boaters and anglers who might unintentionally spread invasive species from one body of water to another. So when boaters pull their boats out of the body of water, they should always inspect their boat and trailer and remove any uh, visible debris like plants or animals, because um, these hitchhikers could move from one body of water and establish themselves in another. So we wanna make sure we clean, drain if applicable, and dry all parts before we move to another location. And we clean, drain, dry to stop the spread of tunicates, mussels, snails, larvae, and plant matter. Another program that we have is called Don't Let It Loose. So plants and animals that are not native to Canada can become invasive if they're released into our waters and onto our lands. You can help prevent the introduction and spread of an aquatic and terrestrial invasive species by not really, oh, sorry, <laughs> by not releasing um, your aquarium pets or your water garden plants, any anything you keep in an aquarium, live food, so like fish or crabs or mollusks, or live bait into rivers, streams, lakes, ponds, or storm sewers. Sport fish should only be released back into the waters from which they were caught, so like a catch and release kind of scenario. And you should never move a sport fish from one body of water to another. Most pets, don't, most pets that are released into the wild uh, don't survive and many suffer before they do die. Pets are usually unable to find the food or shelter in the wild that they need and they often become an easy meal for another creature. However, if they do manage to survive, your pet could become an invasive species that native wildlife don't have the defenses to com compete against. So with the kind of like the example, with the red-eared sliders, so the turtles that introduce diseases to our native turtles because they're just different. One's a pet, a domesticated animal, and then they can carry diseases that our native turtles don't really experience in the wild. Another really great example of Don't Let It Loose is Atlantic whitefish and smallmouth bass. So we have a healthy population of Atlantic whitefish, and then somebody moves 
uh, smallmouth bass into the area because they, they're a fun fish to fish and they, they want to catch more. So they introduce one, but all of a sudden all we have are smallmouth bass and we have no more Atlantic whitefish. So that's kind of the scenario that we're trying to avoid with the Don't Let It Lose campaign. Finally, we have our PlantWise campaign. And PlantWise is a program that supports the ornamental industry's transition to become invasive free. So that means we want to educate gardeners, garden retailers, or nurseries, and, and the landscape industry to understand what invasive plants are, why they're a problem, and what they can do to prevent their spread. So they can stop buying and selling invasive plants. We should be promoting the sale and purchase of non-invasive alternatives and control or replace invasive plant species that are currently in the market. And we also have Grow Me Instead and the Ontario Invasive Plant Council uh, actually has two guides on this. I'm not sure if somebody can link them in the chat, but they're a really good resource that offers native alternatives to popular invasive species that are planted. So we talked earlier about Phragmites, uh, the tall grass. So our native switch panic grass and blue joint uh, reed grass and blue mana grass are really nice non-invasive grasses that you can plant in place of Phragmites. So in the picture on the right here, we have blue mana grass. And then when we talked about yellow iris and the impacts they might have on Atlantic salmon, uh, blue flag iris, which is posted here on the left, is a really beautiful alternative to yellow iris um, and it's native. And yellow, if you're looking for yellow, yellow water lily is another option that's non-invasive. So we're just really trying to encourage people, if you can, to avoid buying and growing invasive plants on your property because it is really easy to make the switch to, to native plants and your biodiversity in your yard will thank you. <laughs> so some key takeaways that I hope I got across during this presentation are that invasive species can be devastating to biodiversity, harmful to people, and expensive to control. Invasive species are extremely difficult to remove once they're established, so prevention and reduction of spread is the best management option. Humans play an important role in the spread of invasive species, and we thus play an important role in stopping them. So uh, again, a big thank you to CCIS for letting us join their webinar week. And a huge thank you to our funders, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, who helped fund our webinars that we've been able to put on. And Beyond Attitude Consulting was the company that um, produced the survey for us that I had a couple slides on. So a huge thank you to everyone listed here. And thank you to all of you for uh, learning along with me today. You can sign up to, for our newsletter by visiting our website. Uh, if somebody could link that in the chat, that'd be great. My email is up there. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And we also have an invasive species forum coming up next week, March 8th and 9th. And I believe registration, a link to registration was already put in the chat, but it's going to be a really great event. So I encourage anyone to come if they can. And yeah, thank you so much. If anyone has any questions, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to take some. <laughs>